Hey everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. I'm Alita, and on this channel we explain the law one bite at a time. So today we're going to do a bit of a spooky edition of Pop Culture Trials as we go into another dimension. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. In other words, we're crossing over into Hollywood legal history. Specifically, the story of the lawsuits that came out of the filming of the Twilight Zone movie that came out in 1983. Coming up on Legal Bites. So first, I need to address something super obvious here. I'm not in my usual studio. We currently are moving, and it's a particularly long move. It's going to take some time before we get settled into the new space, so please bear with me, as you're likely to see a number of studio changes over the next few weeks. In the meantime, if you've seen some of our videos and you haven't already, consider subscribing. That way you can keep up to date with all of our videos, and you can find out where the studio ends up. Okay, setting that aside, you're probably familiar with The Twilight Zone, which is a science fiction universe of entertainment that started with a 1960s TV show created, written by, and starring Rod Sterling. The series has a massive cult following, and for good reason. Every episode had some moral or social critique, and the storytelling was always unpredictable, with relatable, down-to-earth characters. The show was suspenseful, supernatural, psychologically thrilling, and typically macabre and dystopian. It inspired a ton of movies, TV shows, and even a ride at Disney theme parks around the world. It was a really fun ride. <laughs> One movie that followed was the 1983 film Twilight Zone The Movie. It was produced by Steven Spielberg, who reportedly was too busy with other films at the time to dedicate enough energy to direct the entire movie. So instead, he decided that the best thing to do was to stick to the same format as the original TV show by splitting up the two hour long movie into four 30 minute segments. So he enlisted Joe Dante, George Miller, and John Landis to direct the other three segments while Spielberg reserved one for himself. Unfortunately, although this was a golden age of sorts for directors and for these these directors in particular, the filming of the movie turned tragic. Three actors, including Vic Morrow, one of the leading actors, died on set. What followed was a media firestorm and multiple lawsuits, including a criminal case. For the first time, America questioned whether directors and other key film leaders could be held criminally liable for deaths on set. Although this tragedy captured nationwide sorrow and shock, Hollywood had unfortunately long been a rotten, terrible place. Reportedly, the so-called golden age of Hollywood was not so golden for the lives who were in it. It's not exactly a secret that directors, film crew, and actors alike frequently use drugs both as stimulants and suppressants in order to keep up with the grueling pace of film production, and often at the express direction of film producers. But child stars arguably got the worst treatment. Not only did Hollywood regularly break child labor laws on set, but some were put under the influence of what were sometimes euphemistically called vitamin shots and pet pills. In other words, amphetamines and other extremely harmful drugs meant to keep the actors and the rest of the film crew working for extremely long hours. For example, you've probably heard about how Judy Garland Garland was essentially hand-fed a revolving door of so-called uppers and downers during the filming of The Wizard of Oz so she could work as much as 72 hours in a row. There were even reports that actors who played the munchkins molested the 17-year-old Garland throughout the filming. It's no wonder that child actors typically end up with a host of serious issues that plague them for the rest of their lives. On top of that, many actors and actresses were given drugs to maintain a certain weight and energy level. Other stories also report that many actresses were given forced abortions because a baby bump just didn't work with the role that they were supposed to be filming during the pregnancy. One of those actresses was, again, Judy Garland. She really was horrifically abused by Hollywood, and her mother for that matter, who apparently herself arranged at least some of the drug prescription and forced abortions. Anyway, all of that is to say that people often say that the law takes a long time to catch up to technology, and that's true. But as we could see from the horrors highlighted from the earliest days of the Me Too movement a few years ago, Hollywood takes a long, long time to catch up to the law. I remember going to the California Bar annual meeting back in 2015. It was a three-day session, and during one of the lunches, a few actors had been invited to the meeting in order to give speeches to talk about the industry. They described Hollywood as basically the last bastion of open racism, sexism, and sexual abuse. And they pleaded with the lawyers in the room to try to enact change in the industry. But sometimes it takes a major criminal lawsuit to change the entire industry. 
Kind of like with what happened with Harvey Weinstein. In the 1980s, the big Hollywood criminal case was the prosecution of director John Landis, as well as three other filmmakers, George Folsey, Dan Allingham, Paul Stewart, and Dorsey Wingo. To give a bit of a roadmap, like I like to do in these videos, first we'll talk about what actually happened in the incident. Then we'll get into the litigation that resulted, and then finally we'll talk about how the industry actually changed after the lawsuits. Just a heads up. Some of the details in this history can get a little bit gruesome, so if you are sensitive to that kind of information, you might want to prepare yourself. Otherwise, let's get into it. It was July 23rd, 1982. John Landis was directing the segment of the movie titled Time Out in Indian Dunes, an area to the northwest of Los Angeles, a popular spot for filming movies. Landis was known for directing some major hits, which have since become cult classics. Those included National Lampoon's Animal House, The Blues Brothers, An American Werewolf in London, and Trading Places. In short, he was wildly successful in the early 1980s, and it appeared as though his star was rising with the likes of Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and others. But on July 23rd, 1982, the set was filming late. So late, in fact, that according to California labor laws, no children were supposed to be working, let alone working in an environment with dangerous pyrotechnics. The segment directed by Landis starred Vic Morrow as Bill Connor. Prior to this, Morrow was known for his roles in the 1960s TV show Combat, as well as Blackboard Jungle, King Creole, and The Bad News Bears. In the story, Connor is described as a bigot. Throughout the story, he's pulled through time to experience some of the worst atrocities of human history from the perspective of the victims. For example, he's sent to Nazi Germany as a Jew during the Holocaust. The idea is that he's taught through his experiences to empathize with others outside his identity group, and particularly those marginalized by society. In the final scenes, he's thrown into the Vietnam War just as American troops are about to decimate a village of civilian non-combatants. Morrow's character jumps in to save two young Vietnamese children played by six-year-old Renee Chen and seven-year-old Micah Din Lee. As Connor is carrying them across the river, a helicopter filled with American soldiers shoots in their direction. The scene had some crazy ambitious pyrotechnics, to the extent that the electrical crew was allegedly hesitant to light the scene. To do so apparently required climbing scaffolding 30 feet in the air while fighting against helicopter rotor wash. Landis apparently got upset at the hesitation and berated the electrical crew into going up there. Yeah, apparently Landis was something of a dictator on set. At the same time, the pilot of the helicopter, Dorsey Wingo, who by the way was also one of the criminal defendants, apparently was scared by the explosions during the rehearsal, but swallowed his fear. He was an experienced pilot from the Vietnam War, but this was apparently his first gig in Hollywood. No one seemingly wanted to speak up about their concerns for safety in the scene because they didn't want to be fired, or worse, blacklisted in Hollywood. If those people wanted to remain working in Hollywood, those people better keep their mouths shut, and they did. And those people who did in fact come forward afterwards to testify ended up being blackballed for an awfully long time and many of them lost their livelihood. During the filming of the scene, one of Morrow's last lines was supposed to be, I'll keep you safe kids, I promise, nothing will hurt you, I swear to God. Unfortunately, he never got to give that line, and that promise was not something that could be kept in real life. As Morrow stumbled across the river carrying the two kids, the helicopter hovered above them. But then something went wrong. The explosives went off, but they were too close to the helicopter. As a result, it went down sideways, directly on top of Moro, Chen, and Lee. All three died. What followed was a criminal trial that quickly picked up national attention and set the film industry on fire. It wasn't long before a criminal investigation was opened up. The litigation, however, took a very long time. Four years later, the trial is just beginning. At issue, who's responsible for three deaths on the Twilight Zone movie set? Lawyers for the film's director blame an explosives expert, but Sandy Kenyon reports prosecutors disagree. In July 1986, four years after the incident, trial finally began in L.A. County Superior Court. Along with John Landis, four other defendants were charged with involuntary manslaughter. Associate producer George Folsey Jr., special effects coordinator Paul Stewart, production manager Dan Allingham, and the pilot of the helicopter, Dorsey Wingo. At the same time, civil lawsuits were filed by the families of the three deceased actors. This included the children of Vic Morrow, one of whom is the actress Jennifer Jason Lee. In the criminal case, each defendant was represented by a different attorney. Landis was represented by James Neal, who previously prosecuted the Nixon Watergate case, as well as a case against Jimmy Hoffa, the head of the Teamsters Union, for charges of conspiracy and fraud. He also had successfully represented the Ford Motor Company in a major wrongful death action and gained acquittal for Elvis Presley's doctor for his prescription of addictive drugs to Presley. The prosecution in this case was headed up by District Attorney Lee D'Agostino. She was apparently known as the Dragon Lady and had a penchant for her own array of trial theatrics. 
The prosecution tried to paint for the jury a picture where Landis was reckless and thought himself to be above the law. D'Agostino apparently even hissed murderer at him when he passed by her in the court one day. There's plenty of attention surrounding these proceedings. John Landis is the first Hollywood director to face criminal charges in connection with the filming of a movie. Surrounding the trial was a media circus. Every day, the courtroom was packed with camera crews and news reporters, as well as Hollywood supporters. Everywhere around Hollywood, alarm bells were sounding. What's being called the Twilight Zone trial, as we are sitting here now, is taking, uh, taking place. And this is a case where three people were killed in the making of a film. And uh, I think, as far as I know, isn't this trial unprecedented in uh, this sort of thing, and uh, people being held accountable for the deaths of performers? I think it's the first time. Yeah. yeah. That, that a director is, especially. Yeah. Uh, did, did any of you wipe your brow like this when this happened and think this could have happened to anyone? Well, you know, films are really complicated, so it's certainly possible, especially if you you have stunts. Uh, I had a lot of fires, for example, in League of Eagles, and it was something that always concerned me and always worried me. Although it wasn't uncommon for there to be deaths on movie sets before Twilight Zone the movie, this was really the first time that a question was raised as to who, if anyone, on set could be held criminally responsible for it and Hollywood appeared to be throwing its weight behind the defendants. A number of directors spoke out in 1984 in a letter defending Landis. Those directors included John Huston, Fred Zinneman, Sidney Lumet, Francis Ford Coppola, and George Lucas. As is often the case, there was a question as to whether or not the jury could be unbiased in the presence of so much celebrity during the case. It was a very well choreographed uh courtroom from the standpoint of the defense and managing to have celebrities present there, your Donna Michis, your Ralph Bellamy's, and of course the jury was starstruck. Listen, the bailiff in the courtroom was starstruck. She noted the attention paid to John Landis, who appeared to devote much of his time in the courtroom to scribbling on a notepad. I subsequently found out from someone who had interviewed many of these jurors that the jurors believed that what he was doing was writing a script of the trial and that they were going to get to play themselves. But how could they play themselves in the movie if he went to jail? I don't know if the jury actually speculated or talked about any of that, but that's at least according to D'Agostino. Either way, it's undeniable that celebrity definitely played a factor in this case. And despite all the evidence and all the witness testimony, which included a tearful account given by Renee Chen's mother, who said that she had no idea of any of the dangers involved in filming the scene, and despite detailed footage of the incident, which was shown like two dozen times, in the end, the jury acquitted all five defendants. Director John Landis and his associates were charged in the deaths of three people during the filming of Twilight Zone, the movie. In court on Friday, they were found not guilty on all counts. We have two reports this morning, starting with Channel 11's Tony Valdez. Although the defendants were not held criminally liable, a huge cloud had passed over Hollywood, and especially all of the people involved in the filming of this movie. Reportedly, what previously had been a great professional and personal friendship between Spielberg and Landis went totally sour. In the time between filming Twilight Zone the movie and the trial that followed the helicopter incident, Landis filmed the Michael Jackson Thriller music video, Spies Like Us, and The Three Amigos. But after the trial, and especially after a book came out called Outrageous Conduct, which investigates in gruesome detail the entire incident, Landis's career really took a nosedive. He apparently got the job to direct Coming to America a couple years later, thanks to lobbying efforts by Eddie Murphy. But when the relationship between them blew up on set, Landis lost another ally and another friend. Landis continued to direct, but nothing he made after Coming to America really stuck out. And outside of Landis's career, Hollywood started to see a major seismic shift. Suddenly, producers and crew started to take safety regulations much more seriously. According to Slate, Warner Brothers responded to the litigation by creating a committee to develop standards for every aspect of filmmaking, from gunfire to fixed-wing aircraft to smoke and pyrotechnics. The committee included representation by every guild and union in the film industry. What resulted was the creation of a group of standards called safety bulletins, which are regularly updated to this day. And based on those bulletins, studios issued to employees a manual called the Injury and Illness Prevention Program. However, despite the creation of these new safety standards, accidents still happen. For example, in recent years, people have reportedly died on set during the filming of The Walking Dead, Deadpool 2, and Blade Runner 2049. Another change following this trial was a new marriage between the filmmaking industry and the insurance industry. You see, before Twilight Zone the movie, insurers didn't really think that it was a good investment to insure a movie production, given how dangerous they were. In short, there was just too high a likelihood that something would go wrong on set and the insurance company would have to pay out. But two factors changed that opinion. Increase in safety standards 
and an increase in film budgets. Because of that, insurance companies were able to give affordable rates to underwrite movie shoots. To approve the underwriting, insurance companies wanted to know everything. The experience levels of people working on set, how many people there were, how far they were from any kind of explosives or pyrotechnics, the materials that were going to be used, how many fire extinguishers there were, the results of any kind of examinations by a local fire department, the list goes on. And in addition to the increased role of the insurance industry, there was now a new job position on the movie set, risk management. Not only would risk managers now have a presence on set, but they would also basically be consulted from the moment that a script for a film existed. Risk managers consult about big things like unique factors for a geography for a particular film set, like hurricanes, droughts, even political uprisings. But they also serve as someone who can step in when crew members feel unsafe, but they don't want to put their individual careers at risk. Instead of speaking up directly to their bosses, crew members can talk to risk management, who importantly, can't be fired from their position. In all, filmmaking is still a dangerous endeavor, and mishaps still happen today. But there have been some pretty remarkable changes to the industry since Twilight Zone the movie. And although Hollywood is still excruciatingly slow when it comes to catching up to the law, sometimes a big lawsuit comes along and helps it on its way. Okay, that's all we've got for today. If you're still watching, we really appreciate you giving us your time, and we'd love to hear what you think. Do you think that directors and production leads should be held legally responsible for deaths or other injuries that happen on set? Or do you think that it should be up to the individual to know what they're getting themselves into? Let us know in the comments below. At any rate, if you found value in this video, please do give it a like. It really does help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to grow the channel. Anyway, until next time.